my, you know, it's interesting, the way I came into editing was knowing nothing. And um, I sort of learned on the job, um, which was very exciting for me because all the discoveries that I made about what worked and what didn't work, uh, excuse me, <coughs> it felt like, um, it felt like I was inventing the craft of editing, even though obviously I wasn't. But it started me thinking recently, is editing an, an invention or is it a discovery? Because I found myself uh, creating juxtapositions that either were, I found very satisfying or made my toes curl, you know? So, um, there's something about the human brain and, and perception and how we understand what we're seeing that editing connects with in some primal way that makes me feel that it's actually not an invention, but a discovery. So in a sense, I was discovering editing by doing it. And um, it was very uh, satisfying, a very satisfying way to learn the craft as opposed to working for an old hand who would tell me how to do everything. and uh, I would just pick up his ways of doing things. So I'm sure that along the way, uh, I mean, I, I know for a fact that I was doing things in a very inefficient way. And I learned as the years went by, uh, you know, how other people do these things. And I, whenever I found uh, somebody doing something in a, in a way better than what I had been doing, I'd adopted it, you know, immediately. But um, yeah, so, I mean, at first I was just concerned with making, you know, a cut match. Uh, but later on, I got tuned into the, the finer points of the art. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I don't know. That's just something to be said about any sort of artistic endeavor. You know, when you're actually working through the process and you have those little aha moments, it just kind of makes everything that you've been working on snap together, whether if it's, uh, you know, music production, you know, painting, you, everyone always has that little moment that kind of makes things um, snap together. And I think it's those little moments that kind of make, you know, being able to learn something from someone um, a lot more impactful because you're learning it on your own. You're discovering it at your own speed. And, uh, you know, in that way, you kind of make it your own. Yeah, absolutely. So now in your book, and uh, you had stated that you had never gone to film school. You had never even thought that uh, you'd be in the film industry. Um, let me ask you. So was there any certain like film that kind that you uh, saw that you made you kind of think, you know, I think I could do this. I think uh, editing might be up my alley. Well, it wasn't the film that made me think that, but it was definitely a film that made me uh, turn toward the idea of working in film. Um, and I remember it precisely, I describe it in the book, I had um, gotten to the end of my four years at Columbia and I was going to architecture school in the fall but uh, I hadn't gotten enough credits to qualify for my degree and I needed to go to summer school after my senior year. And I got into a program in Paris, uh, very fortunately. And uh, in Paris, we had class until noon and then the rest of the day we were free to, to do whatever we wanted. And uh, in Paris at the time, there were these art houses all over the left bank where I was staying and they were showing American films of the 30s and 40s. And uh, this is the kind of stuff you'd see on late night TV in America, but um, in Paris, they were presented as, uh, they was have a film festival of Raoul Walsh Film Festival. And I think, who's Raoul Walsh? And uh, I started to, and then, you know, they would have a Howard Hawks Film Festival. Who's Howard Hawks? And I started discovering these um, uh, Hollywood directors of the, uh, the studio directors and the French regarded them as works of art. And we had always thought of them as entertainment, you know, just something, some place to go on a Saturday afternoon. But um, around that time in, uh, at the Cinémathèque in Paris, they arranged a, an Orson Welles festival. And I went to see uh, Citizen Kane on a Monday now I'd heard the title, but that was all I knew about the film. I didn't know anything else. And um, 
I went to the theater and it was packed. It was, it was sold out. And uh, the film came on and there were no subtitles in French. And it was playing in English. And I thought, I, these people can't all be English speakers. Uh, and I'm sure many of them came just to see uh, how the things were staged, the, the photography, the lighting, the editing, the music, and so forth. And uh, I was surrounded by these, you know, real cinephiles. And um, I watched it till the end. And when it, it, the ending, when, when, you know, Rosebud was revealed, I was, I was thunderstruck. And I went back the next night and I saw the Magnificent Ambersons. And then Wednesday, I saw the lady from Shanghai. And Thursday, I saw A Touch of Evil. And then Friday, they were showing Othello or Macbeth, I forget which. And Wells was going to be there in person and you couldn't get a ticket. You couldn't get near the place. So um, those four films sort of stuck in my mind. And I went back to New York and to Columbia and architecture school in the fall. And um, after a few weeks, I decided that I just didn't want to work another four years to get another, another bachelor's degree. Uh, I didn't think I could, I didn't think I could hack it, frankly. And I wanted to get into something more exciting. And around that time, I visited an editing room and I saw the editing tools of the day, which were, you know, the moviola and the splicer and the rewinds and so forth. And I was, it was the tools that made me want to go to, toward editing. I thought this is fantastic. Now the moviola was this device for for editing film, where you could go forward and you could stop and you go backwards. This was magic to me, because in 1966 the only way you could see a moving image was to go to the movies or to turn on a TV. There was no video tape recorder yet, and um, you know there was no such thing as pause or rewind or fast forward. Any of those things it was not part of people's consciousness, at least not in the general public and although they did have them with with tape recorders for sound you could do that in sound but there was no concept yet of doing that with with uh, picture so uh, when i saw the movie all i thought boy this this is i'd like to learn how to operate this so that's how i sort of gravitated into editing it it, it didn't occur to me um that i didn't you know it, it wasn't editing i was pursuing it was just this, the tools are what attracted me I didn't even know what editing was, to tell you the truth. Yeah, I mean, there's something about those old editors, too, because um, and, uh, you know, I never went through film school completely, but, you know, I took some classes just to kind of gain a greater appreciation of it. And, um, you know, when we were editing our films um, before we could get anywhere close to a computer editing program, they made us do it by hand with 16 millimeter. They made us appreciate um the craft that actually goes into it because i mean you have to have so much subtle muscle control when dealing with film because it's just such a delicate um it's just such a delicate material i mean it really makes you appreciate you know being able to cut things by hand and actual you know the physical craft that goes into it yeah we were creating an artifact uh it wasn't just um images and sounds we were also creating a work print uh that was going to serve as a guide to the negative cutter to how to cut the negative eventually but was also going to serve as our means of projection to, to show it to audiences and so forth so uh, we took great care in, in crafting a a nice looking work print if possible because um, you had to show it and get reactions from from audiences with it yeah yeah absolutely and uh, well i mean also going back to what you were saying you know about uh you know, the uh, the French cinephile appreciation of America, uh, American uh, film of that era, you know, that golden age of Hollywood, because, you know, and I don't know, maybe it's just uh, because I'm an old soul, th that era of Hollywood just seems so much more artistic than a lot of the films being put out now, because, I mean, you know, film nowadays, it's so um, dependent on CGI and green screens. Back then, you really had to... Uh, you really had to uh, have more of an artistic taste when, when it comes to lighting, setting mood, doing a lot with a little. Um, so I love that uh, primarily Orson Welles was that inspiration because uh, he was one of my inspirations for actually going back and having a greater appreciation for film as an art form as opposed to just an entertainment form. Yeah, but even in the entertainment uh, aspects of it, you had to, you couldn't rely on, on the tools that you have today. For instance, 
you look at the films of Buster Keaton, he's extraordinary in the stunts and, and uh, things that he did. They actually had to stage those things. There was no way to fake it. I mean, there are scenes, you know, there's a movie where he's riding around on the handlebars of a motorcycle and the driver behind him falls off and he doesn't know it. So he's sitting on the handlebars of a motorcycle riding around on this thing. They had to actually stage that, you know, and then they have him go out on a big trestle that collapses and it, he gets to the end of the trestle just as it collapses to the ground and he rides off, you know what I mean? Some extraordinary things that they did uh, in the general, they have a, a, a wooden bridge across a river on fire and they drive a train across it. That was not, there was no trick photography there. That was, they actually staged that. They, they took a bridge, set it on fire and drove a train across. So, I mean, the stuff that they actually staged is, uh, was just extraordinary. And it was, you know, uh, and then of course he did use trick photography in uh, Sherlock Jr. For instance, he's a projectionist who falls asleep and imagines himself stepping onto the screen. And um, they do some wonderful stuff with uh, match jump cuts and um, really inventive things. Um, so it's not all just, uh, you know, moody, arty films that even the entertainments were artfully done. Oh yeah. Yeah. They had to be, um, I mean, they had to be so resourceful because like you were saying, you know, with that train going over a bridge, like talk about having to get something in one take, yeah. <laughs> um, you know, which, I mean, it really just, you know, shows, uh, you know, just goes to show the resourcefulness that they were back then and how they were able to, um, how they were able to set things up and have proper counting it. Uh, timing and be so organized that they were able to, you know, make these shots occur. But I, I mean, I tell young filmmakers that limitations are helpful because limits spur you to uh, think about things in a new way. You know, if you have limitations, you have to engage your creativity to overcome those limitations. So um, if you had a, uh, if you had to paint a painting and there were no edges to the painting, it was, you know, how could you approach it? There'd be no way to, you have to set limits and then you can approach the problem within those limits. And um, people are put off by limitations sometimes, sometimes, but, um, you know, they say desperation creates inspiration. Mm -hmm.